And I will say good morning and good afternoon to all of y'all. Good evening. Um, my name is Margie Dieter, and I am the program manager for the U.S. Physics of Living Systems Student Research Network. And um, we have been communicating more with our physics of life coll collaborators in the UK. And we thought it would be a wonderful thing to kind of bring our two communities together by having a joint seminar. And perhaps we'll have more of these to come um, through the year because we have learned through the pandemic that, that everybody can get online and have cool seminars on Zoom. Um, so today we have Dr. Alice Pine and Dr. Zan Luthi Shilton, who will be presenting to you from Alice from the UK and Zan from the US. Um, and I hope that y'all will enjoy our seminar. And now yeah. Dr. Oh. Dr. Hobbs introduce Dr. Pine. Hey, thank you very much. I'll just say a couple of things about the Physics of Life Network. So this is a a network in the UK that grew out of um, our funder EPSRC um, to try and tackle the grand challenge of understanding the physics of life. And it's been running for about a decade now. Um, and it does a, a number of things. We have workshops. It's an open network across the whole of the UK between physicists and biologists. And we have um, workshops, sand pits, uh, summer schools, and also involved in talking with funders. And there's a big round of funding happening at the moment. So it's kind of exciting times for physics of life in the UK at the moment. Um, and with that, I'll move on to introduce Alice Pine. So Dr. Pine is a, a colleague of mine in the University of Sheffield now, um, but she started at the University of Bristol, moved on um, to do her PhD at UCL. And that's where she really started to get heavily involved in high resolution imaging of DNA. And now um, she's really leading this area of the field. And it's a great pleasure to, to introduce her today. So over to you, Alice. Thank you, Jamie. Um, it's really exciting to be here. Um, and I think the idea of creating more collaboration um, across, the, uh, across the pond is really exciting. And it's great that we can take advantage of some of the harder aspects of the pandemic to move these kind of things online. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about my high resolution studies of DNA. Um, and the thing I want to say up front is this has been a huge team effort lasting a number of years. Um, and it's been a huge multi-disciplinary uh, collaborative approach. And I think that's what's made it the most fun and the most exciting that it's been. So I'm going to talk to you today mainly about DNA. Um, we might all think that, you know, based on Rosalind Franklin's pioneering work, we already know all there is to know about the DNA double helix. But often when we think about the DNA double helix, we think of it in this sort of straight linear form. We might see it on the desk or in the background of scientists on TV, or when we think about it in textbooks, it tends to be in this straight, perfect double helical form. But actually, there's a huge amount of DNA, there's two meters of DNA in every single one of your cells, and this has to be packaged and processed and bundled down into a really, really small volume whilst being able to be read out and transcribed. And so actually, DNA is very rarely found in a straight linear form, and it often assumes quite complex structures. And that's exemplified really well for me by this beautiful structure um, of DNA co-crystallized with the protein IHF and the proteins in the center there of this really strong DNA bend. And I think one of the things that really sort of captured my, my mind when I started looking at this protein, thanks to Agnes Noy and Mark Leek, um, was actually that in order to co-crystallize these two uh, molecules together, the backbone of the DNA actually had to be broken into places. Now, IHF is a DNA bending protein, so it's not wild that it would be found uh, enveloped in a sort of strong bend of DNA. But the fact that there is that in order to obtain this co-crystal, these two nicks in the backbone were needed is a really interesting question for me because it starts off all of the thinking that I have around DNA mechanics and recognition and how it's read out by proteins, because it sort of asks the question. What came first, the breaks or the protein? Did the protein induce bends in DNA that was so strong it broke it? Or did it need to find a piece of DNA that was a little bit broken so it could bend enough to, to, bend, to bind there? Or is it just an artifact of the crystallization process? And so one of the ways we can start to think about finding that out is to look at every individual molecule of DNA and find out what each different one's doing when it interacts with these proteins. 
And so one of the ways we can do this is by using a microscopy technique called the termite force microscopy. And as Jamie so nicely said, I've been working on this for quite a long time now. And a lot of my focus has been on developing high resolution imaging. Now, why atomic force microscopy? Well, it has incredible resolution. It has sub nanometer resolution um, and it's able to, and that's on individual molecules with no averaging and it's able to operate in liquid. So it's a really incredible technique for sort of biophysical studies. And especially for studies of DNA, which is a long flexible polymer that adopts a range of shapes. And in order to understand it better, we need to look at every single one of those shapes and understand what the free energy landscape looks like, understand what conformations it can take up and how those affect how it interacts with things. Now, AFM works instead of looking by uh, through an optical microscope like most of us might be used to, it works by feeling the surface underneath the tip. So here we have a sharp tip and at the end of it, um, a long cantilever. And this long flexible cantilever is a bit like a record player arm. And it feels along the surface, moving over the uh, topographic variations there and bending and reading out what's underneath, much like you might read braille with your finger. Now, much of my work's involved around developing this, these cantilevers to make them higher resolution. These cantilevers are very soft and flexible, about as floppy as a piece of tinsel. And off the end of them, they don't have a small probe like this. They actually have a huge, huge pyramidal probe, which is 10, well, can be tens of microns and it can be twos of microns long. And if you want to think about some idea of scale with that, the size of the probe is about the size of a mountain if the width of the DNA is about the size of a football. So we're kicking around a piece of DNA using a mountain, and we're trying to do that with a probe that's less than a nanometer sized at the end. And it's that end radius of the probe that has been so important in developing these high resolution probes, because actually, until a few years ago, these were sold um, with shapes that varied from one to 10 nanometers. And when we're trying to probe the structure of a piece of DNA that's only two nanometers wide, we can't have something that's 10 times larger than it to probe it. So this has been a huge engineering problem and one I've been really helped with by my collaboration with Brooker. But high resolution imaging of DNA isn't something I've started. It's something that started long before I even started my journey into AFM with Helen Hansmer, who did some of the first pioneering work using tapping mode of AFM, so a gentler technique of AFM to resolve DNA plasmids. And over the years, the resolution has really increased, but it was only in around 2012 that that a huge step forward started to be taken where two different groups, one in Japan and one in London, where I did my PhD, were able to resolve the major and minor grooves of DNA on individual molecules. And this was a huge step forward because it meant we could really start looking at these structures in detail on individual molecules. But the problem with this was that a lot of this research was done using home-built instrumentation, which is fine, which is brilliant, which is so important a lot of the time. But when you start doing biophysical experiments and and getting more into the biology side. If the equipment itself can take days to set up, then you're very reliant on your biology behaving perfectly. And I think most of us who've done biological experiments can say from experience that that doesn't often happen. So a lot of my work focused on working with microscope manufacturers to make this possible on commercial systems, increasing the throughput and making this easier for everyone, not just us to be able to do. And so our first um, imaging of the DNA double helix in situ was in 2014 using entirely commercial equipment. And I overlay this with a double helical structure of DNA, not because I'm referring to myself as some sort of new Rosalind Franklin, but because I think it's important to talk about what we can and can't see with this. So when we look at the double helical structure of DNA, the first thing you might notice is that the AFM image in sepia, it'll almost always be in sepia, is much wider than the B-form DNA structure. And this is an artifact of our imaging by feeling where the tip is wider than the DNA and broadens it out at either side. And it's something that we can remove from the image and we can reconstruct the entire structure. But to be honest, it's something that a lot of AFMers have just learned to live with. But beyond that, we can see that actually the B-form DNA structure and the AFM structure match up really well. With the big difference being that these major grooves here in the center appear huge, even bigger than we would expect from the crystal structure. And then in other places appear to be barely there. So this was the first evidence that we knew of that was observing variations in the double helical structure of DNA on a single molecule. So a really short distance. And we started to try and think, 
wonder where that was coming from. And one of the thoughts was maybe that it was supercoiling introduced variations in DNA structure. So supercoiling is where we take our rope, our DNA rope, and we hold one end fixed and we twist the other end of the rope. We twist that through 360 degrees and then we hold it together. And that is an over twisted rope. And we can do exactly the same. We can under twist it and take one turn out and then we've got an under twisted rope. And if you think of the rope, that changes how easy it is to pull that apart. And this is what's happening to DNA all the time in our cells. As it's being processed, it's being over twisted and under twisted and manipulated in form. And we wondered whether that actually affects the structure of DNA. But to do this on plasmids, they're too big and complicated, basically. So we did what all physicists do best, and we made them into small circles. Um, and so we were looking at DNA mini circles, only around 100 nanometers long. And at this length scale, they were fairly rigid and able to form quite simple shapes, so quite simple circular shapes. And the first thing we wanted to find out was whether we were still able to see the structure by AFM. And luckily we were, we could see the major and minor grooves. And interestingly, we could still see these areas where the major grooves appeared really large and where they were barely visible at all. But much more excitingly, because as we discovered in the pandemic, everything is better with friends. We discovered that our lovely friends who could do atomistic simulation, Sarah Harris and Agnes Noy, were able to simulate the same sequence and without porting anything across between the two experiments, these experiments were done in Santa Barbara and these simulations were done in Leeds, we were able to see that they too could see these areas with these very, very large major grooves and these very, very small reduced major grooves. So it started to feel like it was something that we could see within the structure of DNA. We could see variation within how that structure um, played out around the entire molecule. And this wasn't a one-off. We could do this at two length scales, albeit very close to each other, around 250 and 339 base pairs long. Um, and we saw really, really close correlation between the atomistic simulations and the AFM for all of these different shapes. So we could pick out, pick out different simulations. And actually, if we compare them numerically or by eye, we could see really, really close correlation between the two. And we could do this in static snapshots, but we could also do this in dynamic structures. So this is an AFM, this is eight AFM images of a DNA molecule moving around. And this is a supercoiled DNA molecule that's under some sort of negative superhelical stress. It's a bit underwound. And what we see is that over time, this crossing of the two, this rise between the two molecules, is able to sort of wriggle its way down the molecule and sort of get pushed off the end. And if we look at Agnes's fantastic simulations, what we see is that she sees exactly the same thing in her structures. She sees that this originally writhed negatively supercoiled molecule is able to sort of wriggle its way down and push this writhe off the end of the DNA molecule. So beyond saying, oh, okay, well, we get really good agreement and the structures seem to be helical and they seem to move. What can we see by having this high resolution imaging with the AFM? Well, being able to see the double helix of DNA enables us to be able to see where it goes wrong. And quite a nice example is this molecule on the left. So if we look along this top line here, we see that the helices of the DNA follow each other really nicely. And when they get to this corner, they follow round like tram tracks and they're able to turn the corner. But if we look on the far left side, what we see is from one turn to the next turn, we go from a molecule that's about 90 degrees different in sort of base stacking angles, which means there must be some sort of defect in the structure there. And this is really important because a lot of the time when we come across defects in our sort of simulations and things like that, we might be inclined to push them out thinking that they're an artifact of the implicit salvation or something like that. But here we can see in these natively supercoiled DNA mini circles, the appearance of defects. And these defects, you know, there's no enzymes present, there's nothing else happening here except underwinding of the DNA helix. And so when Agnes did her simulations, she was able to see exactly the same thing. In the relaxed, boring DNA, no defects were visible at all. But as she increased the supercoiling, more and more defects appeared with more and more um, aggressively broken base stacking. So if we see right over here on the right in hypernegatively supercoiled DNA, so this is missing six whole twists. We're able to see that the bases are actually splayed out um, and we form really, really quite drastic kinks at the end of these peptidemic structures. 
Now, the interesting thing was the formation of these defects seemed to happen at about the same bending angle. So if we think in with our material science or our pencil snapping heads on, if we take a pencil or a ruler and we bend it, we'll get so far before it just snaps and it breaks. And DNA is exactly the same. The bending stress induced by adding supercoiling is actually enough to spontaneously break the DNA and induce defects. And we see that this happens at around 75 degrees, irrespective of the method we're using to look at it and irrespective of the level of supercoiling. But what we do see in Agnes's fantastic simulations is that as we add more and more negative supercoils, so take out twists, we're able to see the formation of more and more defects in the structure. So we wanted to see by AFM whether we could see the same thing. Could we see a global change in structure that was caused by the onset of these defects using AFM? And if we look from the left, the relaxed boring molecules look mainly circular. They don't do very much. They're fairly static um, and they're fairly homogenous in their distribution. If we add negative supercoiling, we look to the molecules on the right, we see that they form much more complex structures. They've got rides, which are crossings, they've got platinumic structures, we can see the onset of kink. So often we might just leave it there with AFM, we're quite uh, prone to showing a picture and moving on. But we wanted to take this beyond that and try and quantify what had happened to the DNA structure as a result of the supercoiling. And so what we did was we built a program that was able to recognize individual molecules, pick them out and quantify the structure. And we called that TOPOSTAT. And what this does is all of your tedious AFM image processing, because AFM images begin their life like this, mainly tilt and differences between scan lines. It picks out individual molecules and it's able to trace the backbone of those individual molecules. So to get rid of that broadening effect that we talked about and pick out the length of each individual molecule and give us a histogram with one click of a button. And do I wish I'd made this program a lot earlier in my career? I really, really do. But it's it's been really fantastic for trying to actually quantify what's happening to structures. And in case you're not a DNA aficionado, and if not, why not? And um, this also works on a range of biomolecules with no changing uh, of free parameters required. So we can measure DNA origamis, we can measure pore forming proteins, we can measure nuclear pore complexes, and we can look at how homogenous those distributions are, whether there's any outliers, whether there's something strange happening with our pore formation process. And this even works on imperfect data sets, which is lucky if you've worked in the lab uh, on biological samples, because as you'll know, a huge amount of your data sets are imperfect. And what this program is able to do is to pick out the molecules of interest and still give us really clear histograms showing their trace length to be really, really close to what we would expect from the number of bases present. And it can go beyond just measuring the length of molecules. It can identify their conformational state. So if we have introduced some sort of DNA cutting enzyme, we're able to determine how effective that is by measuring how many of our molecules have been linearized and how many of them are still in circular conformation. So it's been a really, really useful tool for our studies of DNA. But in terms of this study, what have we used it for? Well, what we've tried to do is instead of just giving you some nice representative images, which I promise these are, of what happens to DNA structure as we increase supercoiling, we tried to quantify what that means for the overall free energy landscape or the conformational landscape of things. So what you can see from these chosen snapshots is as we move from the left to the right, the molecules get less circular, more compacted, and they have more defects, which are marked by red triangles. So areas where the DNA is really kinked and above that magic 75 degrees angle. And what does that mean for the overall global confirmation? Well, if we look here, what we decided to do was use aspect ratio as a measure of how compacted these molecules are. So we're going from your old square TV screens to your huge wide cinema screens. So from an aspect ratio of one, roughly square, or in this case, circular, to an aspect ratio of less, which is much, much wider and more compacted. And if we look here on the right, this molecule, the relaxed molecule, it's really close to what we would expect. It's got an aspect ratio of close to one. It's nice and circular. And if we move to the other end of the spectrum, the hypernegatively supercoiled uh, molecules, we see that they're right at the other end. So first off, this, this program is telling us exactly what we expected. As we add supercoils, we get compaction of these structures. But if we look in the middle, the story appears a little bit more complicated. 
So if we look at these plotted another way, what we can see is as we move from relaxed to minus one, we get a decrease in the affect ratio of the molecule. But then as we move to minus two, we actually get an increase in the affect ratio of the molecule, followed by further compaction as we further increase the superquilling. And this is where I have to apologize to my PhD student Carveth and my wonderful collaborator Lynn, who had to who ended up remaking all of our samples to check that this wasn't enzymatic degradation and that something wasn't happening here. And Carveth actually redid all of these experiments. And what we saw is that the distribution remained exactly the same. We got this really stubborn increase in aspect ratio at minus two. And it was only when we looked through our images that we realized that this correlated with the formation of defects in the structure. This correlated with the onset of defects in supercoiled DNA. So what happens here actually is between minus one and minus two, we move from a, uh, from a substrate that's got strong bends and rise to a substrate that's got straight lines and kinks and bends. And if you cast your mind right the way back to the IHF protein, what we've got here is a lot of different shapes that can actually act as different uh, sort of locations for, the, uh, for recognition of DNA by external substrates. And the fantastic thing was that this was also borne out by the simulation. So simulation see an overall compaction, but then followed by a relaxation. And the really, really exciting thing about this is that it's not driven by any external enzymes, and also that it happens exactly around the level of superhelical stress that you would find in vivo, especially in bacteria. It's between about minus one and minus two if you scale it up. So this implies that DNA in the cell is actually always on the edge of being able to buckle and completely change shape to be a completely different uh, type of substrate for recognition. So in my last few minutes, I'm going to talk about how we tested whether this affects affinities. And the way the substrate we chose for this was to look at triplex formation in DNA, where you bind a single-stranded oligo into the double strand double-stranded uh, DNA duplex forming a triple-stranded DNA. And this was designed before I came on board in the project. And I say that because they are almost impossible to find by AFM. Something that intercalates within a surface, within a structure is really hard to see by a surface-based technique. And so it took us a long time to find these tiny angstrom-sized protrusions from the DNA. But when we saw them, we actually saw them on all molecules. And the literature had borne out that this was meant to be a sort of interaction that would be much more preferable in negatively supercoiled DNA. And we could see it even in completely relaxed linearized substrates like this one. And when Agnes simulated this, she saw exactly the same thing. The DNA with the triplex formed was actually very similar in overall conformation to the DNA without the triplex formed. And if we looked at the writhe profile, for example, we saw that the triplex DNA in orange overlapped almost perfectly with the free energy landscape that we saw from the writhe of the DNA alone. So we weren't actually seeing this dependence on negative supercoiling that had been found in the literature. And so then we started thinking, well, maybe we should do a proper biochemistry experiment. We should stop just being biophysics this and trying to do this by the most complicated ways possible. And we'll do some SPR, some surface plasmon resonance to see how supercoiling affects DNA affinity. And what we found was actually very similar, that the linear DNA was actually very similar in response to the negatively supercoiled DNA. And that actually we could in modulate this interaction more using calcium ions than we could using um, supercoiling alone. And it was Agnes who actually solved what was happening here. And what she discovered that was in our mini circles, in our small circles of DNA, actually the electrostatic penalty of binding this third negatively supercoiled strand was perfectly offset by additional hydrogen bonds that were formed when this triplex structure were formed. So the negative penalty that we got by the compaction of DNA and the increased electrostatic forces that were present there were completely offset by this bonding. Um, and I think this is a really, really incredible example of how exquisitely perfectly on the limit nature is. You know, the DNA in the cell is exactly on the point of buckling, and it is exactly at the point where if it has to undergo superhelical stress to form an alternative structure, that's actually perfectly offset by hydrogen bonding. So this was a really, really exciting interdisciplinary study that took us a long time to sort of unravel together. Um, but I think it's also a really, really nice example of how much more we get when we work across disciplines and we work between 
biochemistry, biology, physics, and, and we all work together to try and solve common problems. So there are a lot of people I have to thank um, in helping me solve all of these problems. And probably two of the most important are the DNA stars, Agnes Noy and Sarah Harris, and my PhD student, Claveth, um, and Andrea Slade at Brooker, who's been an absolute huge supporter of my work and, and helping me develop the probes that I use to get here. And so with that, I'll stop sharing and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Alice, for a lovely talk. Um, so do we have questions? I'm not quite sure how you guys deal with questions, I guess, through the chat. But... Um, I think it's OK if people want to unmute and ask their questions. And we typically like to have students ask questions first, as it is a student research group. Um, okay. I see there is a question in the chat. Um, Michael, do you want to unmute and ask your question, or shall we just read it from the chat? Uh, I can unmute. Sorry, my wife is watching television. I was uh, just going to say I've been trying to image some short DNA using your protocol, and um, I often end up with some really noisy surfaces. I can't get as crisp images as you have, and I'm curious what are like the common pitfalls and mistakes people make. Uh, how can I get better images? Um, I guess the first thing is to check, are you using the nickel protocol? Yes, I am. Yeah. And are you working at three millimolar concentration? Um, yeah, I, I followed whichever paper you uh, linked as the protocol. It's changed a little bit between the two. Has it? Um, so it's changed a little bit over time. And we've actually published a protocol on protocols.io recently. Um, but one of the things that can happen is if you're working in a small volume and you get evaporation, then the nickel that's in your solution actually crystallizes on your surface. And so you get nickel mountains. Um, yeah. And so when you're in small volumes or in a hot room, um, and we had... Jamie's labs are lovely and temperature controlled, but my labs at UCL were very much not lovely and temperature controlled. And in the summertime, we'd get huge nickel mountains and in the winter we wouldn't. So one of the things is making sure if your sample starts drying out, if you top it up with milky water, then you're keeping your buffer the same salts. Whereas if you keep topping up with buffer every time it dries out, you're just increasing and increasing your salt concentration. You'll have a huge Dubai layer just above the mica um, and you'll have huge nickel mountains. So you can tune that. Um, and sort of between one and three millimolar, and you probably, you can do it for as quick as five minutes, and then you really shouldn't see anything except your DNA on the surface. That's there's fantastic a, advice. <laughs> Thank there's you. There's a bit of a fixation freedom thing um, that, uh, in terms of how well you stick it down versus how, how nickly it can get. But if you get stuck, feel free to send me an email. I'm always happy to help problem solve the, the tedium of sample preparation. I appreciate that. Thank you. Any more student questions? Are we able to distinguish between positive and negative supercoils from Leo? I have a fellow okay. cake. Leo, do you want to ask your question? Do you want to ask? Or I can just go ahead. I can go ahead and answer that as best as I can. Um, so we've done, we've looked at some positive supercoils in DNA. We've only gone to positive one and positive two. And at that point um, in the mini cycles, we actually just see a really big rigidification. So we don't see any partitioning to rise at that point. Um, so we just see really, really solid twists. Um, so in that case, no, but well, yes, but only because we don't see any rise. I think something we're starting to work on now and will hopefully be published this year if I get, um, if I get my uh, writing hat on um, is that we can actually distinguish topology really explicitly now. So we've been looking at things like four-noded catenanes and twisted knots, and we're actually able to explicitly determine which strand goes over which and count which go under and which go over and which are trivial and which are non-trivial. So, we can't quite automate the analysis of that yet, but we're there with the AFM and we're working on the analysis side. And I think that's going to be a really, really useful tool in sort of topological assignment and looking at some of those complex structures and really working out what they are. Because um, some of the 2D amazing gels that Joaquin Rocker runs for multiple days that are the length of a room aren't always the easiest way to do that. Are there any more student questions before I ask Zan to ask her question? Maybe, Zan, if you can ask yours while others think. Okay, uh, beautiful talk. So, uh, Alice, uh, 
Uh, I had actually two questions. One, what sort of DNA sequences have you looked at? You may have said it at the beginning and I, and I missed it in terms of no, rich or GC. So these are just quite a, quite a muddly mix. We're finding quite a lot of interesting things around A's. We've got some decent A tracks running through and we're doing, you sort of, I love this when everyone comes up with the big floor of AFM right at the start of the questioning. We don't have any chemical ID and it's a circle. So I don't know where I am around the sequence. Mm -hmm. um, but luckily we've got Agnes in hand to tell us where we might be in terms of bringing our two structures together and trying to understand what sequences we might be looking at. And from work we've done on linearized DNA mini circles and with Agnes, it looks like some really interesting things are happening around the A track. Um, we've looked at things that are GC rich, but often with things like um, cruciforms, hairpins, D tracks. So looking at the effect of supercloning on those, um, which has been really interesting. But in terms of just rigid flexibility and sort of AT versus CG, we haven't quite pulled that out yet. But I think the MD simulations could help us with our chemical blindness. And if nobody else has a question, can I ask the second one? Okay, so uh, uh, oh, you had this nice picture, I think, at interaction, interacting with uh, IHF at the beginning. Have you looked at other nucleoid-associated proteins like HU? I hear they're supposed to say, or read, it's supposed to stabilize supercoiling. It's not clear to me how it interacts with the DNA. Have you been able to look at that? So um, Agnes and Mark Leake have just published a paper on IHF um, and I think they've also, there's definitely stuff in the literature on HU but not at our levels of resolution and looking at finding. Um, we're really interested in looking at lots of DNA interacting proteins but our focus at the moment has been on tape wire summarizers mm -hmm. um, and we're starting to get some exciting traction there but nothing uh, concrete enough to um, publish yet. Um, but yeah, some quite exciting stuff on how supercoiling might be influencing recruitment as well as um, in sort of structure as well as people. Then okay, last, if there's... Last question, please. Just uh, okay, Sam. You you, uh, your MD simulations. How long did it take for those confirmations? I, I think I read in your paper, it was like 100 nanosecond simulations you did and you took like the last 30 nanoseconds. Uh, but it wasn't quite clear how big of a range of confirmational changes do you get in that short time? So that last 100 nanoseconds is the explicitly solvated MD. So that's not a huge confirmational uh, window. So the um, matched simulations I showed on an earlier slide are all from an implicit solvent. So mm -hmm. DNA mini circles are quite a stupid thing to simulate because they're a big hole with loads of water ions in the middle of them. So they're expensive to, you're expensively simulating nothing in the middle of a circle of DNA. And um, so we did a lot of implicit solvent, implicitly solvated uh, mini circles and then just did explicitly solvated for the last 100 nanoseconds. And in that we just see them relapse into this lower energy state confirmation rather than actually change global confirmation so much. If that makes sense. Thank you very much. Um, I had a quick question. Uh, you mentioned that the uh, DNA and the hydrogen bonding, it lives on the boundary. And I was just wondering uh, why that was the case. So with the boundary thing, it's, um, it's very much that the supercoiling, uh, it lives at the boundary of this um, sort of change in structure between negatively supercoiled and rived and negatively supercoiled and kinked and linear. So relaxed and uh, compacted. Um, in terms of uh, the hydrogen bonding, it's as we increase the negative supercoiling, we under twist the DNA. As the triplex lies in the major groove, it's actually able to form more hydrogen bonds as the DNA sort of straightens out as it's under twisted. All of these things, I think I should start bringing a rope to see because it would be okay. But so you sort of straighten it out into two train tracks rather than a slinky. And as you straighten it into the train tracks, you're then able to form more hydrogen bonds. And that's how you get, um, that's how you get increased stabilization of the structure. Okay, thank you. I think that cleared my question. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? If not, thank you once again, Alice, and I will hand over to Herbie to introduce the next speaker. Thank okay. you so much. Uh, let me try to share my screen if I can do that.
Uh, let's see, is that working? There it is. No? There it is. Okay. Uh, hi. So my my name is Herbert Levine. Let me spend one moment just explaining the uh, Physics of Living Systems program in the United States. And I should mention that uh, when I say the United States, actually our network includes very strong interaction with uh, German collaborators and French collaborators who have been part of our network for a number of years. Uh, we focus on trying to create opportunities for students who are being trained mostly in physical sciences, physics, chemistry, computer science, mathematics, uh, but are working on problems that are whose uh, genesis is biology. We try to create opportunities for those students to meet each other from different institutions um, and to sort of share their knowledge, share their experiences, share their frustrations with how hard biology experiments are to do. Uh, and uh, those opportunities range from an annual a meeting where we typically bring 200 students together somewhere. Uh, we plan for our this year's annual meeting, hopefully will take place in person in France, uh, in Montpellier in, in uh, de this coming December. Um, we also have uh, social gatherings at uh, various large conferences within the US at the uh, uh, Physical Society Conference, at the American Physical Society Conference. Uh, and we also have online activities, especially over the last year and a half, of course, those have been the only activities uh, which we hope to return to a more mixed uh, balance of online and in-person activities with the idea of creating a community of people, a uh, community of students level uh, people who really uh, get through personal knowledge of what else is going on, a more broad level education in the field and a more broad set of experiences that help them go on uh, for their future careers. Uh, and I think we're very happy. We've tried for a number of years to try to uh, increase our contacts with our, our, our British collaborators, especially Physics of Life uh, system, which has you know, many analogs. And I think this is a great opportunity to begin to, uh, to increase that uh, level of, co of collaboration. Anyway, uh, so uh, from our side of the pond, our, our speaker today is Zan Schulten. Zan is uh, originally uh, has her PhD from Harvard, and then after uh, some uh, set of sojourns in parts of Germany, settled in the uh, University of Illinois, Urbana, where she's been a stalwart of the physics of living systems uh, community for many, many years. Uh, her initial efforts were mostly at the molecular scale, but I think today we're going to hear about some very exciting work that she's pioneered over the last number of years in trying to bring computational techniques up one scale to look at uh, processes taking place at sort of the scale of an entire bacterial cell. Uh, that obviously has some challenges, but would have some great payoffs for uh, both practical questions, but also fundamental questions like what does it really take for it to be, for something to be a living system? So with that, I'm uh, happy to introduce Zan to, to give the talk and I uh, go ahead and share your screen and go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um... Well, the talk's here somewhere. Um, there it is. <laughs> Had too many windows open, right? Um, common mistake. Yeah, well, thank you very much uh, uh, for inviting me to, to speak here. And um, I, as a topic, I, I wanted to present, uh, you know, how you can integrate experiments, theory, and simulations into host cell uh, models, and in particular, one that it has to deal with the minimal cell. And as you can see already from that uh, lower right-hand corner, it's certainly gonna take GPU computing to be able to get there in terms of length and time scales that you want to do. And um, so let me, without any further ado, uh, introduce the uh, minimal cell. It was published uh, in Science in 2016. Um, it's rather small. You can see the dimensions there, about 400 nanometers in this particular picture. The effort there was led by Clyde Hutchinson and Hamilton Smith, who has a Nobel Prize in, for the co-discovery of uh, restriction enzymes. And this thing is so simplified and so reduced, it only has about 493 genes, of which 452 code for proteins. And the length of its genome is about a half a million base pairs. So in every feature you can think of, it's one-tenth of E. coli. Um, 
Now, because there's been such a reduction in metabolism, you have to bring in already uh, things like fatty acids, nucleosides. I should have put another little barrel representing amino acids, but of course, nutrients like, uh, like sugars. And over on the left-hand side, you see the gene map, uh, how you break down those 452 genes. Uh, when we first published this uh, together with the JCVI folks, in eLife in 2019, and the main author there was my postdoc, uh, Marian Breuer, who's now a professor in the Netherlands. Um, there were 91 uh, proteins unknown, uh, had unknown function. That number is decreasing, we're down to 87. But you can see by far the biggest block are those proteins involved in genetic information processing, metabolism, and that little green thing in the corner is cell growth. So uh, let me introduce to you how you would even make a model of this uh, minimal cell and then introduce the, the kinetics into it. So this is from uh, an invited commentary I wrote for Nature Methods recently that you can start with a, in the upper left-hand corner, a cryoelectron tomogram, and you have information about the uh, gene maps. And now if you look at the gene map again, you'll see the polygons have changed size because we also have proteomics for I think almost all the 452 proteins involved. So from those two things, we can then set up a model. Uh, the tomograms also give us where the ribosomes can be located. I don't know if the resolution is good enough that you can see those little black dots are now yellow spheres uh, in the middle picture and the, and the orange dots is the folded DNA. So unfortunately in this cell, you don't see like, uh, regions where uh, it, uh, a condensed region for the DNA, it sort of has to meander through all those ribosomes. Uh, the rest of the proteomics you can add to it. Uh, the kinetics, well, where do you get those? Or, uh, thankfully, uh, many of them come directly from certain experiments. Uh, I showed you the one for the DNA A. That's very important uh, for its binding near the origin of the DNA in order to, order to make a bubble that you can then uh, have the replicone and the DNA P, or the DNA polymerase enter. The rest of the kinetic rates, say for metabolism, uh, they have been collected by the, in the field of biochemistry for decades. Uh, most of them are present in the Brenda database that's in Germany. And, and when you put all that together and start computing the model in the GPU, you can start looking at things like, what's the average mRNA count? What's the half-life? Uh, what are the, you can follow a particular protein or, uh, and have it look at its transcription. That's the green curve in the very top. That's a single run, or you can do many simulations and you can get the heat map that you see there. Now, um, just to explain that picture a little bit more, here again is the tomogram. Now in the center, I'm showing you also the membrane segmentation that was done by Elizabeth's Vila group in uh, UCSD and her student, Vincent Lamb. So as I said, we know the position of the ribosomes, we know the boundaries, you can make up then uh, the cell and now you have to fit in the DNA. And that's a big problem because you have to fit it in. Uh, it's circular, um, so there are not quite so many uh, as what you heard about in the last talk. This actually, as I said, about a half a million base pairs. Um, and uh, it also has to avoid the ribosomes. So uh, in the left-hand side, you're seeing where the right arm is meeting the left arm uh, at the origin. And by the way, in this organism, there are many uh, things you thought you knew that you have to forget. It doesn't seem that the origin is attached to the membrane. Um, and then over on the right-hand side, you're seeing the full DNA folded. And there we used a, a self-avoiding um, polymer or polygon model for it because each of those little objects uh, represents about 11.8 base pairs of DNA. We folded it on a, a, a finer lattice and then embedded it in the eight nanometer uh, lattice so you can have different parts of the DNA also coming together within the eight nanometer cubes. And, and once we had placed the DNA, we uh, then uh, turned to our other collaborators, Ramos Dame and his student, uh, Rashid Fatemi Rashid, who had done an, a 3C experimental map on it. And if you look at their map, uh, it doesn't have very many features. 
in fact, they could really only confidently identify about four loops. This was at a thousand base pairs resolution. We looked into ours, uh, we blow it up over here. Uh, as I said, this was enforced, uh, getting the loops in these positions. And then in the circle that's above there, we've tried to put the proteomics data along with the DNA on both of the strands to see if there was any uh, correlation to things that were highly expressed or, or had low proteomics numbers. So one of the features we noticed right away is this system does not have a PAR ABS system. It does not have IHF. In fact, I think the only nucleoid associated protein it does have is HU and there are way too few of them. It's only 28. It does have SMCs, about 200, but we cannot say for certain that those are the ones that are forming the loops. Now, when you initiate the DNA uh, replication, you have to have a protein, it's called DNAA, sort of unfortunate name, that binds to uh, uh, signatures that are nine long and they're here. There's a red one and two yellow next to it. Uh, it binds there and starts un, uh, twisting the DNA. And then another domain of the DNAA binds to this AT rich region next to it, uh, three nucleotides at a time uh, uh, to open it up that you can start and get in the, rep, uh, the replosome in there. And in the pictures below, you see just what I said in words, here are the high affinity binding sites. You get binding to them and then you start opening it up and then you get this filament being formed. Now. The kinetic rates for those uh, filament formations had thankfully been studied already. In fact, in 2014, where they just uh, flew, uh, would flow in uh, DNAA and, uh, and through an SM FRET experiment, you could see uh, when you were in the low state or the high state when the dyes were, uh, were separated. And from their model, we could then come up with the K-ons and the K-offs. And, and then when you form 30, then we would allow uh, the uh, elongation and replica, uh, uh, elongation of the DNA replication to take place. We use a polymer model uh, with, with slight modifications that was already published in 2013. Um, it has a, you have to have an enzyme. So in replication, it'll be the DNA uh, polymerase. In transcription, it'll be the RNA polymerase. And in translation, it will be the ribosomes. The monomers are, of course, the deoxynucleotides or the nucleotides or the amino acid or rather the charged tRNA. Um, and if you use this model, you can, uh, in the upper diagram, this was some really uh, uh, studies that we did back in 2019, you can see that the filament uh, for, forms at sort of different times. In that picture A, you're seeing four different cells out of maybe a hundred or a thousand cells it's over a time of about 40 minutes. You could see one could form very early on, one forms more at about seven minutes, 15, and there's even one that takes almost 35 minutes to get the filament and the bubble formed. So B, you're seeing the distribution of formation times. And so depending on where you start, that uh, the time that remains in the cell to continue the uh, growing um, uh, and then or leading then to uh, cell division will also vary. So in this region here in C, you're seeing the initiation, here is the replication. And then from this period on, you have uh, uh, continued uh, cell division. Now, that's sort of a brief uh, 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 summary of the genetic information processing the essential metabolic uh, network of this minimal cell was published already in 2019 um, uh, with, by Marion as the key author there. And it's simple enough, we can write it down on a page, but for physicists to study it, you have to really give each subsystem to a different person and then they become an expert on those. Because again, as I said, the parameters, they can come from the uh, Brenda database or other experiments. One of the things that was interesting, here was a beautiful experiment that was done on the uptake of the sugar at the top there and to the uh, central metabolism. It involves a phosphorelay system. So several proteins have to be uh, uh, phosphorylated before it gets close to the PTSG, which is a membrane protein that can phosphorylate the glucose coming into the system. 
So these numbers here that were in the 2019 identify exactly which genes uh, these things correspond to, all right? And, and where you are at the end of this is so-called G6P. And from here, you could go off to lipid metabolism or go down one more modification of the sugar and it'll lead you into contacts with nu uh, nucleotide metabolism. The interesting thing about this minimal cell, and again, it's against all of our intuition, there is no oxidative phosphorylation. So all the ATP has to come through the rest of the central metabolism. So if you take up about 14 to 16,000 glucose per second, you will be producing ATP at a rate of about 35 to 45,000 per second. Uh, now, uh, let's go over and look at the right-hand side on the nucleoside, uh, nucleotide metabolism. As I said before, it brings in nucleosides over here. That's the symbol for it. This is the genes for the transporters. And in a few steps, you get to a nucleotide. And you do this not only for the nucleosides, but you also do it for the deoxynucleosides. Um, there is also some recycling that takes place from the decay of the mRNA. And uh, once you're down at the bottom, now you have all the nucleotides you need to make the R R ribosomal RNA and the messengers. And over here, you have to satisfy the demands of the deoxynucleotides to replicate the DNA. The imbalance uh, leads to a pool size. And I think I never really appreciated that this could be time dependent and can vary during the cell cycle. People often try to publish just an average number, but we can actually calculate it at any time. Uh, let's look at uh, lipid metabolism. So again, here's the fatty acid I talked about before. It's coming in, uh, it gets phosphorylated. And at the end, you're creating two types of lipids one are PGs and one are cardiolipids here, which is essentially uh, just putting two of these together to get uh, a lipid with uh, four uh, hydrocarbon uh, tails on it. Now that we're doing this properly and the growth is proper and we can get a, the flux through these things are really controlling our volume expansion and our surface area. In large part, we have to really thank the work of uh, James Sense's lab in, in Dresden, who done lipidomics on the minimal cell, together with the lead chemist uh, in the Greg Venter Institute. So those two people together, we could feel quite certain about this uh, lipid metabolism. Now, we'll put this all together, we'll have reactions, and we also will have diffusion taking place in this cell. If you're just looking at a well-stirred version of the cell and you want to talk about its state, you can write the evolution equation just in terms of the reactions and the reactions that take you out of a state or bring you into a state. I put here hybrid CME uh, ODE because this would, is what we used to do just to look at genetic information processing, but we're coupling now and everything I'm showing you it with metabolism. So those fluctuations in millimolar concentrations of some of the metabolites, you don't need to handle stochastically. So we will connect this uh, to an ordinary differential equation for those. Uh, there's another version of this program called lattice microbes, of which you can now allow for the spatial heterogeneity in the cell. And you have to add then an extra label to this, which subvolume, where are you in the cell? So you put in a diffusion operator along with the reaction operator, and down below, you're seeing one of our early simulations. Uh, this was on E. coli, um, where the tomogram came from Wolfgang Baumeister. We can see where the ribosomes were at the two ends and along the side. The DNA was in the center. You have a gene going off and on here, and that gene makes a membrane protein, which is in yellow, which can diffuse in the membrane. And it allows even more food to come in. So this was called a lack genetic switch. If you take a slice through the cell, I just wanted to of emphasize, it's quite crowded there. There are open spaces. The orange dots are now uh, the ribosomes, uh, but it is quite packed. Now, uh, as I was explaining, we have to use these hybrid stochastic deterministic methods. Uh, and so like if we're treating say genetic information processing, um, uh, uh, stochastically say like using the Gillespie direct solver, 
you would have these stochastic events. And then after a certain time, you have to communicate your results down here to the ordinary differential equations. That is simulated again. And you, we use an uh, adaptive time-stepping algorithm. And then the information has to be fed back. And the things that are being communicated are enzyme counts, the number of nucleotides, deoxynucleotides, and the recycled uh, monophosphates, uh, as well as the energy costs. Because each of those reactions, and particularly the transport, require ATP. And you can see down here at the bottom the number of reactions uh, for genetic information processing and metabolism that you have to take into account. Um, so now let's look what we get out of this model. We're just preparing this for public uh, for to submit a publication. So if we look first at just the time, and we know from our colleagues, experimental colleagues, that the doubling time is around 100, 110 um, uh, minutes. Uh, we look at the volume increase that we get, um, and we notice that it comes in right about after the first replication event takes place. And then we assume from then on, the rest of it goes into forming two separate cells. And again, if you look at the surface area expansion that we get, um, there's a time when you double the volume, and that's again at about 65 minutes. And when you double the, um, the surface area, it's, it's a little bit a uh, larger range of values that they get here. So we get everything from like about 90 minutes to 110 minutes. Let's take a look at those pools I was talking about. This is just of the nucleotides. And, and um, in this cell, you can see that the uh, ATP level can get up to about eight millimolar. The ADP level stays at around four. Um, and the others all drop to around one or two. But over here in this cell, uh, it looks like the uh, GTP uh, value is growing but the levels of ATP and ADP all stay a rather low. The, the annoying things, uh, these ranges are all in, in, in published in the literature. Uh, there was a beautiful study that was done about by uh, Rabinovich at, at Princeton back in 2016 on E. coli. So there can be a range of, uh, of these pool sizes. And the, and the fact that you're seeing here variation, that is because of the coupling, as I said, between the uh, genetic information and metabolism. Uh, let's dive in a little bit more deeply about the time-dependent ATP, co ATP costs. And as I said, you, you have costs, but they have to be balanced by the generation in the central metabolism. So uh, black is what's generated, blue is the total ATP cost, and here are the various ways you can spend your ATP coins. You can use it for transcription, replication, mRNA degradation. You can put some of it into RNA. I didn't show you uh, translocation. We have to put the membrane proteins into the membrane. We have charging of tRNA. And all those import reactions, are most of them are active transport require ATP. And plus, there's an ATP synthase cost and kinase cost. Uh, that's one way of looking at it. Perhaps a better way is to try to normalize it uh, to one, the ATP costs, and then uh, look at them as in terms of fractions of these other costs. And I'll just draw your attention to, uh, to one curve here or two curves. If you look at the active transport costs, it's up here. It's a substantial cost. So I think people are, we're never getting quite right the the ATP economy, unless they took into account how much is really used in flowing in all these uh, nutriments and building blocks into a cell. The other thing I want to point uh, out uh, is this green curve here, uh, which represents uh, the, uh, the DNA replication costs. So uh, you can see here, this cell started replication at about 10 minutes. Over here, it started later, closer to 30 minutes, and uh, was over at about 60 minutes. So roughly, the DNA replication ticks somewhere around 50, 55 minutes, uh, depending on where you're starting it. In fact, there's some cells where it starts even earlier. And if you looked at the volume dependence of the DNA binding, 
you can have a, a multiple replication events take place here. But the main message of this slide is something I just keep emphasizing that look at the fraction that you need uh, for active transport. Uh, uh, somebody asked us to show, well, what about trans, uh, look, putting those membrane proteins into the membrane? So we put that in here, but that is rather a small cost using SEC-A and SEC-Y that's in the system. And I wasn't the first to draw attention to it. I just read this paper because I loved the journal from Stoutheimer back in 1973. And I thought, oh, this is great. We'll really have to look at this. And uh, Lynch tried to, uh, to do a nice study in PNES, but again, he left out the active transport. So now let's look at some time dependence are showing you nucleotides. Uh, let's look at the time dependence of some of the metabolites over a cell. And in our study that I'm talking about here, we have the reduced genome has very little uh, regulatory proteins left in it. Um, and also the uh, small RNAs like riboswitches that could help regulate things. So what I'm showing you is without regulation um, and the two curves represent either a uh, multiple replication event it has taken place in that cell or up here is a black curve, only a single replication event takes place. And you can see that if you have multiple replication events occurring, in general, the, the the nucleotide, the deoxynucleotide pools will always be much smaller. And that makes a lot of sense. It's being used up again. So it can't accumulate like it would here. But uh, making more DNA or even partial parts of DNA comes with a cost of now you are allowing more phosphate uh, to pools to get larger in the cell. So this already told us we really need to be looking if there is any type of phosphate or inorganic phosphate regulation. So let me end the talk by just showing you uh, a very a brief movie where we put all of this together. Uh, it'll be only over 20 minutes sort of before DNA replication starts taking place and, and, uh, and, any, and growth has really occurred to any large extent. So uh, in, this, uh, in this movie, the yellow will be the ribosomes. They will change color when they're translating messenger uh, the degradosomes, which I didn't have a chance to talk about, uh, it's a complex that's on the membrane uh, that, uh, that decays the, uh, the mRNA, uh, it'll be red. And when it's uh, chewing up a, uh, an mRNA, it'll turn blue. And the DNA is again, the orange here. And if you look very carefully, you can see a little blip of green attaching to the DNA, that will be the uh, RNA polymerase. So if you focus sort of here up in this region, you'll see that when one of the ribosomes changes color, shortly thereafter, if the degradosome is close to it, uh, it will also start processing that mRNA. So again, this one was on, and then this one is processing. And that's, it. And this would be wonderful if we knew where we should be placing the degradosomes on the surface. But again, that information has not been available. So we, when we don't know, we just place them randomly. All right, so again, what do the results look like? Let's compare those 20 minutes when we're doing the, uh, the full spatial model with the CME model where you leave out diffusion so you can see they sort of agree over those 20 minutes. Uh, this is for the genetic information processing uh, proteins. These are their messenger counts uh, and, and using both methods. Uh, the same thing here for metabolism. So people often ask, well, why does, uh, you know, how does diffusion make a difference? Well, what I haven't told you is from the studies that we do in the spatial resolve, resolution, we get the number of active degradosomes, the number of active polymers, uh, excuse me, uh, ribosomes. And that helps us then uh, determine the probability of binding for the well-stirred model. So it's really essential to be able to look into these uh, and to be able to do the uh, full spatial simulations. So how do then the mRNA half-lives compare if you have the CME? you see that you get a, a mean of about 
If you look at the RDME simulations, at about 1.6 is the mean. And if you compare them to the experiments that have been done on other gram-positive uh, uh, bacteria, uh, they agree rather well. And these are the groups that uh, did these studies. If we look at the protein counts, over the 20 minutes, you should get a, a, an increase of a, like of about 1.1. You get that in the CME. You're slightly underproducing things on the side of the um, uh, RDME. But again, we have not allowed any ju uh, gene duplication to take place. So any of those proteins near the origin are going to be undercounted. So what have we learned so far about the rules of life for this minimal bacterial cell? Um, is that we know that the central metabolism has to generate the ATP at a rate to accommodate all the time-dependent energy costs. The rates of replication, transcription, and translation can vary over the cell cycle in response to low abundance of these uh, monomers. I didn't show you the formula, but it'll be very clear uh, how the, those terms enter in there. And the volume dependence of the DNA binding allows multiple replication events to occur. Um, and because of what happens when you def uh, definitely when you have multiple replication, uh, you need some degree of regulation of the phosphate. And I would also say of the transporters to achieve uh, homeostasis. And what I didn't show you is that there are some fluctuations they, they create an imbalance between metabolism and genetic information processing from which the cell cannot recover. So either the, in the central metabolism, what happens you, do, you run immediately out of PEP and then you're not making any more ATP and then all the processes start, stop. Uh, what we would like to include in the future is a kinetic model for actually the pinching of the, uh, of the large cell with twice the volume into two separate cells. Uh, we're working experimentally and computationally on a model for this. We don't have in our kinetic model at the moment any of the RNA and DNA modifications that can take place. And we know to stabilize the ribosome, there's a number of modifications that should take place. And also we, we don't have the assembly of the complexes, we just account for them. And as we move forward with the other types of regulation, we would be wanting to put in small RNA regulation. Oh, um, we can skip this. This is just to show you how the rates change when you run out of amino acids. Ah, come on, go back. Uh, and instead, I'll just end here showing you all the people that are involved in this. So this is Elizabeth and uh, who did the tomography, uh, Wolfgang Baumeister at the Max Planck in, in Munich also has helped us with some of the tomography. This is the Greg Venter Institute, the synthetic biology group, very important programmers, John Stone. He does not only VMD, but he also helps us with our lattice microbes code and adapts VMD so we can look at our trajectories. Uh, and over here, uh, Tay Kipa, he's actually working, uh, one of his postdocs is providing us with the information about where the FTSC uh, is binding uh, I've already mentioned James. These are outstanding group of students. Uh, and Maddie is looking at uh, cell uh, morphology. And Ramos Dame was helping us with the three C maps. And once we have a complete model made, we are, uh, started a collaboration with the, the Marek lab so he can build a coarse grain model of the minimal cell to see that our state of the cell is actually physically uh, uh, possible. And there are a number of funding agencies, but of course the most important is the NSF and, and the help that we get in fact now from an engineer at NVIDIA with our code. And with that, I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Zan. That was a great talk. Well, I'm trying to get rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So if y'all want to put you can put your question in the chat or you can just ask your question directly. And again, we're going to ask, um, we'd prefer to have student questions first. So do we have any student questions? Uh, hi, uh, I had a question about the lattice microbes. Uh, uh -huh. grid. So I think you said it was it, the compartments were eight nanometers. 
So how did you um, decide on that? Hmm? The oh, yeah, the sub volumes. Yeah, how did you decide on kind of making them that size? Yeah, that's uh, every time you do a simulation, you have to think that through. So you start by uh, the way that it's working, because you uh, when you're doing the spatial simulations, you don't want something to diffuse uh, over several lattice sites. So look at the diffusion coefficients, right? Okay. And that's one thing. Also, the size of your uh, system in general. So for example, uh, with E. coli, it's about 10 times longer. You can take uh, the subvolumes more like 30 uh, uh, nanometers. Because we took eight, the ribosomes are sitting over several lattice sites. And the, and the simulations I showed you, uh, we have fixed them at uh, the positions that were given to us from the, uh, from the tomograms. What we did vary is we have multiple simulations with different DNA configurations that came about from that uh, self-avoiding uh, polygon model. Does okay. that help? Yeah. Um, oh, also I had a question with the DNA replication, mm -hmm. is it kind of moving around kinetically or the DNA is like fixed during that? Um, yeah, so in most bacterial cells, so like if you look at E. coli or Calobacter um, uh, or even mycoplasm pneumonia, they have what's called an attachment organelle which keeps the origin fixed to the membrane, uh, that's not in the mineral cell anymore. So, okay. um, and you can also see it, uh, if you look very closely into the three C maps, um, if, there, if it's attached, you will see uh, a secondary, a very a much stronger secondary uh, diagonal coming in, which is not evident in this one at all. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay, good question. Other questions? We have a question from Clark Templeton. Do you wanna unmute and ask the question? Oh yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, great talk Dr. Sheldon. I was uh, kind of curious, how adaptive is your model to, you know, like, heat shock or, you know, kind of outside chemical factors, if you know you have some external stress acting on the cell? Um, you know, you, because if this involves, uh, you know, reactions, you, you'd have to have some idea how that takes place. Of course, this thing does uh, communicate. One thing I didn't put in here is what is the external environment in these cells? Uh, uh, we take it exactly uh, what the experimentalists are, are doing. It's a defined medium now, so we know how much glucose, how, how much of the amino acids. We've told them they, for some buffering reasons, they thought about lowering the phosphate levels. And we said, no, no, don't you do that. Because then it was having lots of trouble at the beginning of the simulation. So it's back up to, I, I don't know the exact amount. I think it's like over hundred millimolar, but uh, we know exactly what's in the external environment. If you wanna put something in there um, and then you would have to have some idea what that should interact with. So one of the reasons we're, we will be publishing uh, both versions of the program, the well stirred as well as the uh, spatial model is we think with the well stirred one, that's where you can go and uh, you can run it on both a GPU or a CPU. It's pretty fast. So if you want to complexify the network, if you want to add another pathway or another interaction, you can do it. And more easily, uh, if you are running the spatial model, you have to be pretty good at GPU computing. We try to make it as simple as possible, but um, it's still, you have to sort of know where do I need to make those changes. Yeah, thanks. I was just kind of curious, you know, if you could add like some type of carcinogen and see, you know, almost like a cancer formation. So you do have like this explicit DNA kind of replication. Yeah. Actually, the one simulation in that direction we've been sort of asked to consider, it are, there are people who have put this minimal cell, the Syn3A, 
have put it into yeast. And that's completely doable. And uh, to see how it would respond. Um, and because we've also simulated yeast way back when. And again, Elizabeth Avila and uh, Wolfgang Baumeister uh, gave us the tomograms for yeast and so that we could build up a, a full model of, uh, of yeast. It just, it's more complicated because uh, although the metabolism of yeast is somewhat known um, thanks to the beer and wine uh, companies uh, who want to make better beer and better bread, uh, you still don't quite understand all the other organelles and where they're attached. But the knowledge is growing at leaps and bounds with, with tomography, I have to tell you. Great, thanks. Jamie, do you wanna unmute and ask your question? Okay, uh, lovely talk. I was just wondering if active transport is so high a fraction of your ATP usage because you've knocked out all the rest of the synthesis sort of machinery in the cell or is it, is this, what exactly. really goes on in a real cell, a normal cell? Uh, I, think, I think that's why uh, when Lynch did his study on E. coli, it's not such a big deal. Uh, you have, uh, it may take 47 steps to go and make the nucleobase and then the nucleotide, but they're all there. With this minimal cell, you take in a nucleoside and in three steps, you're at the nucleotide. So you have to be bringing it in at a rate to keep up with DNA replication or making of the mRNA or the, or the ribosomal RNA. And it's when you have that imbalance between nucleotide metabolism and uh, say genetic information processing, you can get a slowdown in any of those rates. All right, so yes, it's, uh, it really needs uh, to use a lot of ATP for that process. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? So maybe I can ask Alice one, now that if she's still there. Well, sure. uh, Alice, if you're there. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, so, uh, you know, when I read your mini uh, uh, loop uh, paper, I thought, hmm, you know, uh, that's why I was asking about if it's AT rich. It would be so nice to try and uh, make a, a loop that contained those, sign those uh, signatures for the DNA A binding and, and really try to get at that in a molecular level. Uh, you know, as I said, the closest we have or the uh, SM FRET studies to, to get the rate of binding and unbinding. But it would be also great if one could see that on one of your mini loops. Yeah, I was thinking that when you were talking because you've mentioned it before. So I was thinking through that while you were talking. I think we're not great at rates. So the time scales that we see things on aren't always aren't always the most helpful for AFM. I think we quite, we see things move through the same conformational space a lot of the time, especially because the mini cycles happen to be really planar, which really helps with that oh, because we're God. sticking them down to a surface so that okay. it, was, it was luck, not judgment. And I'll admit that in an open audience, but they turned out with the length of the sequence and the way they were designed that even in the simulations, they appear really planar, which means that we don't actually get huge structural perturbation sticking them down. Mm -hmm. Um, but we're really interested in moving to more complex systems, more to say, um, not necessarily, we're looking at um, conformational changes in takeaway summaries and how those are rearranging the mini circles and we're able to see all of that, but not on the correct timescales. But what we can see is the conformational space we move through. Does that make sense? Oh yeah. So I think there's interesting things there in terms of where it binds and, and, and how it's acting. Well, I just know that when our paper on the DNA was uh, was published, one of the reviewers said, well, you can't say the loops are by, made by SMC. And that's true, we can't. I can only say that's the main thing that's left. So I would also be happy if we know sort of where those loops are being formed, take that section of the DNA and put in SMC and the SCPs 
and see if they ad, 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 do indeed bind to those regions. I mean, there are ways to, to answer that question, but as I said, of course, uh, we could not uh, claim that. We just strongly suggested. And just because we learn from other groups like what Jose uh, does down in, in, in Rice and they made these studies of the role that the SMC plays in, in the DNA. So it seemed important. Yeah, there's a really nice um, preprint from Seth Stecker at the moment that shows um, condensing binding to the tips of plectinemes using optical tweezers, um, which I thought was really interesting. But from our paper, that would imply that condensing therefore binds at defects because we seem, we seem to see these defects forming around the tips of our mini plectinemes. Mm -hmm. um, and ox DNA simulations have shown that you get defects at the tips of plectinemes that pin them in place. And so I thought it was interesting that that paper sort of didn't go any further into what structural motifs are causing this recruitment. You know, they saw the recruitment, but they didn't go into the structural motifs. And so mm -hmm. that's the kind of thing I'm quite interested in digging down into is what are these sort of, not necessarily sequence based, but what are these structural motifs that are actually causing things like that sort of recruitment and, and, and and increases or stimulations in local activity. I think at the moment we tend to still talk quite globally, you know, positive in front, negative pre catenemes behind, magic in the middle. Um, and I think we're quite interested in finding out what is it about the positive in front that's recruiting to for some reasons or condensing? What is it about the negative behind that's resulting in underwinding and, and creating maybe these alternative structures? Yeah. Well, as I said, uh, when you get ready for kinetics, please call me, all right? All right. We're slowly getting there, but I think our kinetics, because we've got, because we've got a surface there, they're always going to be wonky. They're mm -hmm. never going to be the same as if you were not near a huge Dubai layer and a big negatively charged surface. But I think that doesn't stop us understanding what the kinetics move through, if that makes sense but not necessarily stating explicit times to them. And I think it's quite complementary with something like SM FRAP, where we can say, well, these are the confirmations we see. How quickly are you moving through things and try and therefore be a bit more sure about how we're assigning SM FRAP um, signals to structures. Okay, well, that's wonderful. All right, well, thanks everyone for sticking with us to the end. Um, so that was a there are not gonna be any more talks, right, this summer? I don't, I don't think we will do one this summer, but I think we had a great turnout. So I'm, think, I'm thinking that maybe we'll do this again, perhaps in the fall, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it and, and see what we decide to do. Okay, Margie, yeah. yeah. But thanks everyone. This was great. Bye-bye. Good talk. Yeah, thanks. That thank was a really nice talk. Along. Oh, thank you. Yours too. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for organizing it everyone.